Hello and welcome to Educated STEM. I am Kate, the founder of Educated STEM, and today we're going to continue the series on how to be successful in graduate school. So please remember to like and subscribe to the channel. So let's talk about meeting with your mentor. So at this point, you have probably decided on which lab you're going to join, and you are going to be hopefully meeting with your mentor frequently to discuss your progress. So the first thing is, how is that meeting going to be? How frequent is that meeting? Do you have a standing time? Um, or is it more of they have an open door policy and you can kind of just show up when you want to? During my PhD, I actually had a standing meeting with my mentor. I knew that at a particular time on a Friday afternoon, I would need to show what I had achieved that week and kind of explain how I'd done things and what I was going to be doing the following week. And that really helped me because I knew when I had to prepare and get things done. I've also worked with people who have more of an open door policy. And that's okay. Um, you know, you go to them when you need to, but the problem is there might be a really long line of people also waiting for them. And so getting in there and actually getting all of the things that you need discussed can be quite hard because even if you're in the office and you've sat down and you're, you know, you've started the meeting, someone might knock on the door and interrupt. And then, you know, the meeting might end for whatever reason. So personally, I prefer it if you have an assigned time, whether that's every week, every couple of weeks, whatever it is, I think it's just beneficial. You know when you're expected to have your data and you also know whether you are expected to just kind of walk in there with your lab book and you can kind of show them what you're doing or if they would like more of you know, a PowerPoint presentation with things displayed more easily. It just depends on what works with you, how you prefer it. I know what I prefer, but you might prefer something completely different. In your first couple of weeks, you're in the lab, Hopefully you already had this conversation before you chose the lab, but if you didn't, now is the time where you can set some expectations. And there are some things that I think that you absolutely need to address. I would you know, encourage you to go and download the document that I have on Educated STEM on Patreon. It will cost you a whole three bucks, but for the price of a cup of coffee, you can have this list of things and you can go in prepared to ask the questions. So first things first, who is going to be your main point of contact for learning techniques, maybe troubleshooting issues? Is it going to be an experienced postdoc or maybe a lab manager? Or maybe they're going to want you to go straight to them, uh, which is always interesting because depending on how long your professor has been outside of a lab, uh, maybe it would be easier and better to go to someone who's actually doing the experiments on a day-to-day -day basis. But ask them, who is the first person that you go to for help? And maybe if they can't help you, you then, you know, postdoc, then go to the lab manager and then find you end with the professor. Who knows? But what do they want you to do? What hours are you expected to be in the lab or the office? You know, do they expect you to be there you know, between the hours of nine and five or even longer? Do they expect you to do your coursework in there when you have gone to your graduate school classes and then you come back or, you know, are they fine with you potentially going to the library or even working at home on whatever you do? It depends. Some people just physically want to see you present and that might just be a requirement in their mind. So before you get into trouble because you were not there, when they thought you ought to be, let's figure that out. Does your mentor expect you to write a fellowship or a grant proposal in order to support your research? If you do, then you're going to need to get some help from them. So what are the funding agencies that they would want you to apply for? Let's figure out you know, when we're going to um, apply and all the other things. There's going to be a video later on in the series to talk about that. The next thing, what are the conferences in your field? This might be a brand new field that you're completely un, you know, unfamiliar with. So what are the conferences? You know, what are the associations that hold them? 
when will you be going to a conference and is it necessary to present data? I was lucky and I got to go to a conference every single year. And the first year, I didn't really have anything to present until the end of the year, but that didn't stop me from going to them. Now that is highly unusual. My PhD supervisor was incredibly generous. Um, but you know, ask the question. They might have the funds in order to send you, um, even if it's just a local conference, for you to begin networking and learning the field. Um, or they might not. Uh, who will pay for your conference attendance? So is it the mentor? Um, do they want you to potentially get funding from the graduate um, school? There might be a travel award that you can get. Most conferences will have some sort of travel award that you can apply for. So are they, do they require that you get and actually receive those funds before you can go to the conference? Is just applying for them sufficient? Um, you know, other, all different professors expect different things. So you should figure that out. If you're going to be applying for funding from your school or program, you also want to figure out, maybe there's a limit on how many times you can be awarded this. Maybe there's a limit of the funding, how, mu how much funding can go out per year. So, you know, maybe you need to apply for funding early in the, in the financial year to make sure that you can actually go to a conference. Some things to consider. You might want to note down the various dates for the conferences and also when the abstract um, application or submission is needed. That way you can plan your experiments and also figure out when you're going to do, you know, your courses and other things because you might be able to just do a little push of research to make sure that you have the data necessary to write an abstract and you can go back and you know finish some assignments or, or whatever but you need to plan these things out um, and then you know some people are very visual and something called a gantt chart um, will help you do that or maybe just a list of times however it works for you uh, make sure that you have everything under control does your mentor have a certain expectation for the number or quality of your publications so your program or your school probably has some kind of rule about whether you are required to have a publication before you can defend and leave. Um, but your mentor might have a completely different idea. And so knowing that going in, you know, they might say, I expect you to get a top tier journal or maybe, you know, two publications of like a mid tier journal might suffice. That will be different potentially from the school. So just know what is expected and also know that if you're not meeting that expectation that you might need to go to either a graduate school administrator or your dissertation committee members to discuss what happens so you can actually you know, leave because at some point you need to leave the program and graduate hopefully with a PhD. Uh, the next thing is what are the mentors rules for authorship on papers? So if you help someone, how much help is necessary before you get your name on a paper? I was incredibly lucky. I learned a lot of techniques from a postdoc in my lab. And whenever I did the experiments and replicates for her, I there was then an author on her paper. So it was very generous that I got to learn all of the techniques before I even began my own project and I still managed to get publications out of it. So hopefully, fingers crossed, you can also um, be in a situation similar to that where you, know, you can get training, you can help other people and you get their name on the paper. Likewise, maybe they get their name on your paper if they have helped you and you know, kind of given you the ideas and taught you the techniques and helped you analyze the results or whatever. So you get multiple publications out of it. The final thing is, are there researchers who they expect will be on your dissertation committee? Sometimes people want to kind of stack your committee with people that they're comfortable with or friends or people who owe them. Um, and sometimes they will give you carte blanche or you can choose whoever you want. So are they going to be a more controlling um, mentor? 
and kind of tell you who's going to be put on your committee or are they going to kind of generally just help you figure out who is a who is a good choice something to definitely consider if you know that there are certain people that they generally would want to have on a committee then you know to start making a good impression on them immediately so that you know they can hopefully have that good impression throughout your entire graduate school experience and they will help you uh, throughout. The next thing to consider is how do you remember um, information and the references that you're reading? And so in that handbook that you were given, there might be information about which program they expect you to use when you're referencing. And if that is the case, then make sure that obviously you use it and begin as soon as you start reading papers for your research, because the sooner that you start making your kind of library and also making the notations of, you know, this paper did this. And sometimes it might be really obvious from the title, but also there might be key things in that paper that aren't obvious from the title. So you want to annotate that as well. So just some thoughts about potential tools that you might want to use. EndNote is obviously the gold standard and hopefully your school department, whomever um, will actually have that for you. But there's also Mendeley, there's Zotero, there's Scriber, there's MyBib and Cite This For Me just off the top of my head. Uh, so hopefully you utilize one of those and make sure that however you set them up is the way that you are expected to then put it in your dissertation. So just you know, make sure it's already set up at the very beginning. It makes it so much easier. The next thing I want to think about is any training that you might need to do. So if you're doing work with animals, then you're going to need animal training and you're probably going to need to be familiar with something called the IACUC, which is the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee. If you're doing anything to do with human research, then you're going to need training and you're going to need to be involved with the IRB or the Institutional Review Board. Are you using stem cells, at which point there might be um, something to do with a stem cell research oversight committee, sometimes called a SCRO or Scro will be somewhere in the title somewhere. Do you need radioactivity training? That sort of thing. Let's get all of the training done as soon as you enter the lab so that you can actually begin your research. Because some, some trainings only happen at certain times of the year just so that they can cram as many people as necessary, get it all done, be as efficient as possible. So if that needs to happen, make sure that you know who's doing the training contact them and let them know that you need the training. There might be a price. So who is going to be paying for that training? Hopefully that is your mentor, but sometimes the mentor would like the graduate school or the program to pay for it. So just know all of that before you go in. Um, and if you need to then do the research, so there might be an existing IACUC protocol if you are performing experiments which have previously done in the lab. If, however, this is a novel experiment, <clears throat> you will have to write a document explaining what you need to do, and that is going to be reviewed by the IACUC. And so that is just going to make sure that you explain the research that you're going to do, why it's necessary, how many animals you're going to be using, um, you know, what is the end point uh, in the experiment, how you're going to mitigate the distress and pain of the animals, all of that good stuff. So these are not easy documents to write. I would urge you to contact someone who's very familiar with the IACUC or even on, on the IACUC and get their assistance to make sure that you complete the document well. You've covered all of their um, issues because they probably meet maybe once a month. They will go through a stack of applications. And so you want to make sure that when they come to yours, it's well written and hopefully they can approve it. If they have other questions, they're just going to ask you to redo or, or add to the document, which then might delay the ability to start again. So let's make sure that you are putting together a quality um, application. 
before they review it. Same thing if you're doing um, IRB approval for research on humans, contact someone who's done that and make sure that the application is as good as it can, can be. Same with SCRO, so that's the stem cell one. Again, there's issues with that because now obviously you can use um, or get stem cells from a variety of places in the body. It's not necessarily a human embryonic stem cell, um, but there are obviously issues regarding that. So that is going to have some oversight. One thing to consider is that people on the committee aren't necessarily all scientists or aren't um, experts in your field. So you need to write it in a way that a non-scientist can write it. Typically there is somebody on the panel or the committee that is a non-scientist, so maybe a bioethicist or a lawyer. Um, and usually there might even be someone who is just from the community and they decide as well. So make sure that your documents are easily read, easily understandable before they go for review. Uh, final thing, if you're getting radioactivity training, it's probably, you know, very simple. You just go along and get it. But if for whatever reason you're using a new isotope that they're unfamiliar with, then there's probably going to be some more hoops that you have to jump through, especially if you're bringing something onto campus potentially for the first time. It might not be as easy as you had hoped. So I hope that helps. Uh, please like and subscribe to the channel and uh, come back for the next video, which is going to be talking about fellowship and grant applications. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.